Next, we need to look at a few constraints that will always be incorporated every time we are using field names. One of it is what we've had was an integrity constraint. And in this given case, when you need to force that data must be populated in a given column, then we normally use the not null. Not null implies that in that particular column, it cannot accept null values. In other words, we must populate data into that particular column. For example, we can declare position var car 10 not null. So it means for position, we must populate something. There's another category that is called domain constraint. So this puts a limit onto the type of data that you can populate. And it uses a check condition. For example, you may be wanting to populate the gender. And you only want gender to be populated as either M or F. So in this given case, if someone attempts to populate a different value or a different character, not M or F, it's supposed to draw an error. The next one is what if that was an in entity integrity. And in this given case, we look at the concept of the primary key and the foreign key. Remember we said that a primary key is a unique identifier within a particular relation. And being a unique identifier, it must contain a unique non-null value for each row. Question is, how do you define that a particular field is a primary key? There are two ways to do it. You can either, while you are creating the table, at the bottom you can include primary key into bracket and you populate the field that is forming the primary key. Alternatively, where you are creating the fields, you can say property number, it's an integer, we can say it's not null, implying that it must have value, and then you can add the primary key. Instances where more than one field form the primary key, then you can populate primary key at the bottom, and within the bracket, you put the two fields, that are forming the primary key. There are instances where you may be having what you refer to as candidate keys, which you require they should also contain unique values. For instance, in a student table, they could equally be having an email or a national ID number, which we expect for each and every student they will also be unique. So you can enforce through the use of unique at the bottom and you specify the fields that you also want to be unique. There's something we also refer to as referential integrity. This occurs where we are having a foreign key. A foreign key is a field in one table that refers to a primary key in another table. We normally say that if there is a value inside the foreign key, that value must equally be existing in the table that has the primary key. How do we declare a foreign key? We declare a foreign key assuming we have two tables and in another table that's why you're having the branch number as a foreign key, we are going to state foreign key branch number references this is the table or the relation that has the primary key. So references, branch, and we specify the primary key in that particular table. A different way, where for example, we say foreign key owner number, references, private owner, owner number, but there's something we are adding here, on update cascade, on delete cascade. What does it say? What does this statement mean? On update cascade, on delete cascade. It implies that anytime you want to do an update on a particular record in the primary table, or you want to delete a record in the primary table, that action is automatically going to be effected in the matching records in the child table. So you only need to effect it on the parent table, and it's going to 
take effect even on the child table. Minus incorporating on update cascade on delete cascade, you'll be forced to first of all go and update the record in the child table before you update the record in the primary table. Thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.